Hi, and welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Sherry Lynn Bisbono, your host. Today, we're going back to the classics. We're talking about discovering the classics and why writers should be reading the classics and what we can learn from them. I have a wonderful guest, and she's a good friend. Her name is Catherine, and I want her to tell you about herself. Catherine, welcome. I'm so honored and privileged that you're here. Well, Cheryl, I'm so excited to ask you to be on your program. Um, it's a lovely, cold day out there, so it's nice and cozy in here, and I got my tea, so I'm looking forward to our chat. So tell us a little bit about your writing history. Oh, gosh, I've been writing ever since I was a little girl. Very, very, I loved stories. I loved making up stories. Imagination play was always something that um, I could get just lost in. As a matter of fact, I, I forced it on my son. Um, I could not <laughs> wait until he got into imagination play so we could make up stories together. And, and so the poor eight month old is sitting there and I've got imagination toys and I'm wondering why he's not like into it. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually he got there uh, and he was a, a Lego maniac building his world, his Lego world and his story, his stories there. Um, as a little girl, um, I, I wrote, I have a lot of my writings from my youth. Um, so it was interesting to, to see, you know, where I came from in that. And I was always fascinated with old things, old books, old stories. They were the best to me. I wasn't, I didn't know a lot about what was going on contemporary wise because I was always going back to the ancient. Um, and um, the books that, that I loved the most were uh, historical in nature. So uh, when I saw my mother reading Victoria Holt novels all the time, I, I would sit there and, and stare at the uh, and the the picture of the great old castle and the, the the woman in the beautiful dress you know running down the lane you know and the trees blowing and it, it just fed my imagination so um, I did I did start my gothic mystery novel when I was about 10 years old wow yes I did I sat down I had a quill pen and ink because I what I thought writers did and <laughs> And I had my little lined paper. I got about five chapters into it and realized I could only describe what I saw on the dust covers of Victoria Holt novels for so long before I, I didn't have the life experience to write a, uh, a gothic mystery novel at age 10. But uh, the writing has stayed with me and the love of history and old things has too and has informed uh, my reading life and my writing. I admire that. I can't say that I wanted to write when I was young. I didn't. I just, I just started three years ago. But now you said you have stories from your youth. I do. Which one is your favorite? Do you have? Can you share? Well, uh, gosh, I, I, I don't know. A lot of them were short stories uh, or um, little. Uh, characters. There was one where I tried to actually create the book. I think, how old was I? I was 11. Uh, put the Gothic mystery novel aside. Had one of those old typewriters. And um, I actually laid out the book. It's a children's book. And every so often I go back to it and I think, you know, if I do some adult editing on this, it's not really a bad children's book. It was called Emily's Picture. Um, I did all the illustrations myself. And um, had a kind of an interesting thing I was doing with watercolors as the backdrop because the whole thing was about co uh, color. And um, she couldn't decide on what color to paint certain things in the picture. And she was going around to everybody that she knew in her neighborhood and, and uh, asking what, what color she should do this, that, or the other. And um, uh, I, I'm not sure I don't even remember how it ended, quite honestly. But I, I thought it was very cute. And I even at that time, I had an eye for um, storytelling as far as a camera. You know how a director directs a movie? Mm -hmm. um, they're able to like, like get what's going to be in the shot. Um, as an adult, I'm looking back at this piece that I did and setting up the pages, what text goes on one page and, and then how I have and telling the story and developing it with visuals. And I was actually pretty surprised that um, 
I naturally had a, a, a way of, of doing that. Um, nobody taught me that. And um, I was blessed to have teachers in school who recognized a, a raw gift and encouraged it. That's impressive. Now, we're discussing rediscovering the classics. What, how old were you, and what was your first classic novel that you read for, to completion? Well, um, oddly enough, in my childhood, it was not so much um, that I had the people in my life putting classic novels in front of me. I was familiar with things. For instance, um, I heard about Jane Austen. And I knew she wrote a book called Pride and Prejudice. For some reason, I thought it was War and Peace. I, I, for years, I thought Pride and Prejudice was not going to be interesting to me at all because it was going to be about war. <laughs> I don't know what, what the deal was there. Um, uh, I was in uh, school at a time where the world was changing in the 60s and 70s. And uh, we were getting a lot of modernist books being passed off as classics, um, but they were actually more um, agenda driven. Um, and that was what was being uh, replacing some of the really great classics, uh, even back in the 60s and 70s. And it, it is more so today. I, I, I've been in some of the schools, I've seen what they're putting in front of mm -hmm. young people. And it absolutely breaks my heart. Me too. Me too. My they, son is in high school and some of the stuff that they have him read, I'm like, why? Why? Just because it has a swear word in it and you want to shock yes. the kids? Yes. <laughs> when, when you see them removing Johnny Tremaine and replacing it with a book that is full of foul language and uh, uh, really edgy um, storytelling techniques and, um, and themes that are just absolutely disturbing mm. um, and, and open-ended, where um, for a concrete thinker in middle school uh, and even in, in, in the early high school years, to be putting a piece of literature in front of them and saying, this is for middle readers, this is for young adults, and you leave it open-ended and those kids don't have the foundations to make uh, choices, really, when you leave them an open-ended thing like that and you have just taken them on this emotional journey, um, their immaturity emotionally is mm. going to force them into a place where their, their minds are going to uh, go exactly the way that the author um, wanted yeah. And uh, that, that's a shame. So I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit and I'm going to ask you, if you could replace the books, what classics would you want say like our middle schoolers or say YA age to read and why well you know you you really need a good healthy dose of Charles Dickens mm -hmm. Dickens and his language I could sit there and read a 30 word sentence which is anathema today with editors <laughs> but cut that up into like 10 different sentences. Yeah, ten, ten chapters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for your 30-word sentence. I will sit there and read a 30-word sentence and I will have to stop and sit back and sigh at the brilliance of mm -hmm. how that sentence was crafted and what he just communicated with wit and humor and depth and, and, and his use of the word, how they roll off your tongue, the mm -hmm. richness of the language. And what's fun about Dickens is um, he was paid by the word. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. He was paid by the word. All of those novels that he wrote were originally serial. So they were accessible to the common person. So he really did a lot to advance the cause of literacy in um, the lower classes in England and in America because now the book or the novel was not this expensive thing that, that was only for you know, people who had the money for it, but the, 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 the tuppence or, or two penny uh, cereal that you could get every week had the next chapter or the next part of the story. Mm -hmm. And so people were looking for that. And um, so this is why his, story, his books are so like huge, um, but also because he was paid by the word. 
And he was such an amazing wordsmith that nobody cared. And people had more leisure time for reading in the 19th century. Yeah. They, they, they wanted the meat and potatoes of a book that they could just sink their teeth into and, 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 and uh, uh, stroll with the uh, people in the book for hours. Um, today, we want everything chopped up fast. You know, we want to be able to get into it and get out of it in a couple of hours. And, um, and I think that's a loss uh, to us as a society as well. Mm. We want to be microwave readers. Yes. And, and you know, when you are a microwave reader, there's something that changes. Just like when you put food in a microwave, there's something that, that changes mm. in the uh, chemistry of the food. Um, I, I, as I've read <laughs> online um, in different places, there's a, a chemical thing that happens in the food. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, like, like, don't put bread in a microwave, for heaven's sake, it tastes terrible. Yeah, it's, so is it, I, I have to admit, I have not read a lot of the classics. I read Great Expectations and things like that, but I don't read them for pleasure now. Mm -hmm. Convince me as a writer why I should be reading these books. And convince other writers who are just not reading them because they're either too long or whatever. I know a lot who do, but convince me. I, I, you've already pretty much have, but pretend that I don't want to. Convince me. Well, uh, technically, um, the edit the editing is is different today than it was then because everybody's thinking, well, this is our contemporary society, so we have to write for our contemporary society. Um, people don't have as much time to put into the reading. They want it really, really fast. Um, reading the classics is, is hard, but harder is better. And when I was teaching in the classroom, that's what I told my kids all the time. Harder is better. I mean, I dragged my son through Moby Dick. He hated it. He absolutely hated Moby Dick. But um, there's such a richness, not only to the story, to the plot, um, to the depth of, of the issues that are being dealt with and how they're being dealt with, understanding our, our former um, societies, the different eras that the people mm -hmm. before us lived in. If we don't know where we came from, then we don't know who we are. And then we have no direction for where we ought to be going into the future. Literature is the handmaiden of history. It's like it mirrors our history. The, the literary efforts of the ages. And it's important to understand history. History is, mm. is his story, it's God's story mm. of how he has worked through and dealt with man, bringing him through to uh, the great finale of redemption eventually in individual lives, as nations, and as a world, his story. And so uh, literature and specifically Western civilization, our Western literary heritage is fascinating because it's going to be a mirror of, of that society and what we can learn from that. That's why the, the Bible tells us the older needs to teach the younger. Mm. So the classics are the old, the ancients. You read Plato today and Plato is as relevant today mm. as to the day that he wrote it. And, and his, his, his mentor um, was, was um, martyred wow. for, for, for it because for the thoughts that were being played out there. Um, I, um, I, do, I do love uh, Plato and, and then coming forward and right now is actually it's very fresh. Um, I homeschool um, mentor. Uh, a uh, homeschool student. She's a, a rising star in the Irish, traditional Irish music uh, world. And um, we are, uh, we meet every week. And I uh, mentor her in literature and uh, composition. As a matter of fact, we're writing a novel together. You'll hear much more about that in a couple of years when she graduates and we finish it. <laughs> but um, the, um, the book that we're working through this year, we are enjoying so much. It's a collection of essays uh, by Off uh, Guinness and Louise Cohen. They've compiled uh, these essays from great writers on great writers. It's called mm -hmm. An Invitation to the Classics, and it's a wonderful overview of um, our Western literary heritage. What is the name of the book? It's called Invitation to the Classics. 
I highly recommend it for writers just to give you a good overview. They're, they're short, uh, relatively short essays with follow-up probing questions and other references that you can get into. And it gives you a good overview. To be able to write today, we need to be able to allude to our, our history. Mm -hmm. And um, so this gives you, you know, you miss the Shakespearean references if you don't read Shakespeare. Right. You know, so, uh, and, and that also is a tool in your kit because the, there's nothing new under the sun. So the literary tricks that the writers of the past, the great classic writers of the past have used, uh, they're, they're still good to use. Wow, wow. Now who wrote that? Who wrote Invitation to the Classics? Invitation to the Classics is a lot of different uh, writers and essayists um, who have contributed to it. It's compiled by Oz Guinness. And, Oz Guinness? Yes. And, I've heard of him, yeah. And Louise Cowan. Okay, I think I'm going to go get, I'm going to start there. <laughs> that's a really good, actually, that's a terrific place to start. It gives you a good overview. Uh, some of my favorites are in there, of course. Jane's in there. Um, uh, I, I, since, you know, my youth become educated on Jane Austen, and now I have <laughs> well, a lot of Jane Austen, <laughs> anything Jane Austen. Um, but also, uh, I love George Eliot. Mm. George Eliot's life story, she is a fascinating woman and her book there were only six novels that she wrote they they're the one adam b there is a three-page scene in there where the heroine is actually a young methodist female preacher wow yes that's that's pretty uh, radical for it's back then very, very, very radical. radical um and she goes into a jail cell and um, presents to a, a woman um, caught in a place of scandal. I just don't want to do any spoilers on it. She presents probably the best presentation of the gospel in literature I have ever read. And what book is this? It's called Adam Bede, B-E-D-E. -E, and it's by George Eliot. George Eliot is... Uh, actually, her, her real name was Marianne Evans, and she um, published under a man's name because in the 19th century, it was very difficult for women to, uh, on their own, uh, get, get a byline. Um, wow. I'm going to have to look and say the name of the book one more time. Adam B. B E B E. That's another book. That would be a fabulous book to get it into. I'm writing it down. Yes. I want to go. I want to go read that scene because it, it, it's wonderful. It's it's more towards the end. the The other thing that I really like about it is they could present such a scandalous scene, and you come away from it and you don't feel dirty. For instance, it's a two sentence uh, seduction scene in that book, and you don't you realize what has happened. You realize the import of it, but you don't feel dirty or filthy. Absolutely. So we actually could, I talked to Bob um, Hostetler and that, that chat will be coming up. It's his call for Christians to write with integrity and that you can write a good story without the swear words, without the sex. I mean, like these, so this is a good way to learn how other people did it. And so you could put it in your... It, our, our writers now could learn from those older people to older people, older authors, and learn how to do this respectfully. Exactly. Novel writing uh, prior to uh, Jane, um, she was born in 1775, and um, uh, always was, was writing, um, died far too young, unfortunately. But uh, she is credited with developing the novel format because um, prior to that, um, in the 18th century, the, the um, novel form was very much about letter writing. As a matter of fact, her first book, Lady Susan, is all uh, letters, letters back and forth to people that tell the story, which is very interesting. Mm. And she began to... to, to um, 
follow uh, Fanny Burney also was one of the people that she read who was a tremendous influence on her. And again, she's going back a generation and she's learning from that generation. And um, so the novel developed throughout the 19th century and um, we are flooded with just some amazing uh, works. Uh, Lamplighter Publishing republishes in beautiful editions that look like the originals from the 19th century and, and the books themselves in that time period were works of art. Um, Lamplighter Publishing um, takes out of print books from the 19th century that were popular reading and again they were all written from a biblical worldview. So um, they were perfect for family reading, they were considered um, appropriate books for uh, education because they told great stories with strong uh, biblical moral foundation. And um, they have a, a whole vast collection of them now. Actually, they even have Lamplighter Theater. They've got them in audio book. They're, they're a fabulous wow. group. Um, uh, so I do, I highly recommend them. Uh, I work with a lot of homeschoolers. That's one of the first places I'll go for, for you know, if you want books, stay out of the bookstore, go to Lamplighter. You're gonna, you're gonna love, and they're wonderful read aloud. Mm -hmm. really really are so um when when you see the novel progressing through the 19th century there's just there's so much there and you see the people weren't really much different than they are today no they really, really weren't now i go to on uh, kindle kindle has a lot of free classics yes they you do. can download a, all a, most of the classics for free I, I was really surprised. I own on Kindle every word Jane Austen ever wrote for five dollars. <laughs> and and uh, Dickens, I got his entire thing uh, on uh, on my Kindle, and and I, I got him for like under five dollars. Wow! It's, it's, now, not that reading on a Kindle is is easy. I don't find it easy, quite honestly. I think I like reading a book better. I do. I, I was like thinking that. I just ordered a few books to read. I'm trying to read at least a book a month. I know some people read a book a week, but I do, as a submissions reader, I do a lot of reading. So when I go to read something else, I, I, my eyes are so tired, but um, I've been choosing some of my books and some of them are Kindle. And I just went and ordered some online used because I kind of like holding, holding it, yep. holding it. And I, my eyes get more tired with the Kindle. Now I want to ask you, what is the greatest lesson you've learned open when you've rediscovered the classics i mean you've told us so many things but like a per, maybe a, a personal thing that you've learned or something you've learned for your craft the craft of writing um i i think i was forced to not skim over things um when when i talk to families uh, about uh, reading and my platform is literacy. I guess you could have tell them. I can tell. I am like blown. I, I I am blown away by your knowledge. I'm like, oh, because I hope I don't have to know all that. You are you are very informative. You should teach a class. Uh, yes, that well, actually, that's that's kind of what I do. <laughs> and, um, so book me, somebody. Yeah, call me. I'll come in and I'll talk for hours about literature and literacy. And you make it. You make it. I've decided, you know, after listening to you, I want to read the classics. You give me a reason why and you make it alive and beautiful and you, it, uh, you, you describe it in a way that people would want to go read them. Yeah, there's the old paths often are, are the best. They're, they're most well-traveled and there's a reason for that because they get you to where you need to be going in, uh, in, a, in a way that's uh, easy uh, even though well, i've got my, my cats coming in to visit us today <laughs> oh have them come in oh no she's, 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 uh, it's funny because we were discussing this yeah. with each other um before and she said my cat might come in i said don't cats. worry about it <laughs> we okay. like cats we like dogs we've had we've had dogs come in but so. the um the idea of reading deep telling parents and, and, and you should see the shock on their face when I look at them and I say, what are you reading aloud in your home? And um, reading aloud and uh, books are, were not a part of their life and they struggle with making it a part of their children's lives. 
Mm. And I look them square in the eye very firmly. And I say, I give you permission to be the primary educator in your child's life again. Mm. Because once parents were, mm. and they're in shock. That you mean that's my responsibility. I don't just send them to school and do whatever the teacher says. No, sorry, not in today's world. Never again, unless there are major, major changes made. Mm. So in helping families to understand about reading aloud and how to choose material to share with your children reading aloud, the classics scare people because they say, "Well, there's words we don't understand, and, and what does this mean?" And I say, "Isn't that ex?" Exciting. Now you have something to look up. And what you're doing is you're passing on a tool for learning. You teach people how to learn. They have learning for a lifetime. Mm, yes. And what to learn, it goes in and it falls out right away. And so reading a hard book is better because you are forced to read deeper and to think harder about it. And what that does is it builds the little gray cells that help you to be a critical thinker. And if we don't have critical thinking parents, how are they going to raise critical thinking children? And how are you going to build discernment? And this is what reading the classics it, it does. It, 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 it cha it's challenging, but it's also extremely rewarding. So do it with your phone nearby so you can look up the words. I was gonna and say, we need a dictionary when we read the classics, correct? We do. And sometimes they'll refer to something that goes over our head. Um, they don't go any deeper to explain it because, well, when it was written, everybody knew what that meant. But you may not, and you may need to do a little custom and manners, what was you know, normal in society. I've got a terrific book called uh, What Jane Austen Wore and Charles Dickens Ate. And it's... <laughs> It's a terrific book because it has all of these things that were like prevalent in their time that, that is not normal for us, that they allude to in their book, um, which is why it's interesting to read Pride and Prejudice in the annotated form because there's all sorts of things in there, just like reading Shakespeare annotated. There's things that they refer to that it's like, wow, uh, I didn't get that when I read it. Now it means so much more because I understand. Historical fiction authors today, they do all that research. And yeah. when they write a scene and they're going to allude to something that's going to give you a sense of the time period, they write it in such a way that they are informing you at the same time that you're reading it. But mm -hmm. when you're reading a book actually written in a particular time period, you're not always going to get that. So what's that forcing you to do? It's forcing you to learn something new. Right. So what I'm hearing you say too is also that in the back of my head is if somebody wants to write historical fiction, maybe they should read books that were written in the time period that, that they're, in they're writing in because then they'll get the uh, verbiage and they get wow. the, language, the way they use the language and certain allusions to, to things that were prevalent at that time then they follow up, they do the research, they have to know all these little details. It's a terrific blog with uh, a lot of historical fiction writers that will um, submit blog posts uh, as a result of some of their um, research work. It's called Colonial Quilt. And uh, oh. I love that because there's so many great colonial quilts. Okay. And um, there's so many great uh, different historical fiction writers that are writing in different time periods and they discover in their research something really interesting um, that might just become, be, show up as two sentences in their book. But mm -hmm. the amount of work that they had to do to mm -hmm. make that relevant in their story and be in mm -hmm. to the reader, um, they are... Uh, pulling their research together and then they'll, they'll put a blog post in there. And for somebody like me who loves history and loves some of that, that extra background information, it's a terrific, uh, it's a terrific read. I, I'm not laughing at you, but on Facebook, Colonial Quilt is a Facebook page. And I no, think- no, This is Quills, Q-U-I-L-L-S, like the- quilt. Oh, Quills, I'm sorry, Quills. Okay, Colonial Quills, Never mind. Like a writer with a pen. 
Okay, colonial quills. I thought you said quilts. Okay, because I. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Sounds like a really good one too. I love. <laughs> So we only have like two minutes. This is going by so fast. I'm going to go back and listen to this again because I've learned so much already. But what do you have a work in progress right now? Are you working on a novel? Well, you know, I love encouraging young writers. And uh, like, for instance, my, my young homeschool students, uh, we're writing a really, I'm really excited about what she's doing with this novel. We have terrific editing sessions together. Um, I love when I go, like, we met at the Greater Philadelphia Christian Writers Conference, mm -hmm. and I, I did a couple of workshops there, and then sitting down with people and looking at their work and helping them to, like, really bring out the full potential in it. I love that. And helping young writers get mm -hmm. vision for their words and mm -hmm. being able to communicate. So what I'm launching, and I'll have the marketing out later this month, I'm launching uh, an anthology, a young writer's anthology. I'm calling it the Poema Apprentice. And, uh, Poema is a word that's used in the Bible, um, in Romans and in Ephesians, and it means a work of art, like a masterpiece. Um, oh, it, wow. Uh, um, translations have translated it. And it, it, it means a masterpiece attributed to a work that God has created. And God's created all of us as creative beings. And so what I want to um, young people to see themselves as an apprentices to the creator God who created them to be created. That sounds very, oh, that sounds like a beautiful book. Yeah, so what I'll be doing is taking submissions. Uh, they'll be getting uh, professional editing from me that I'll help them make it the best that it can be. I'm not just going to take what people just send me. It's like, you know what, we're going to work on this until it gets really well. And um, then we're going to um, probably I'm gonna start a nice closed Facebook group. So I'm excited about that, being able to work more one-on-one uh, -on -one with young writers and homeschooling parents that are looking for help with their children who may be a good writer, but they don't know anything about it. And um, so we're hoping uh, to have uh, the layout um, and design process starting in the fall, and then we'll be um, getting the first year, 2018, it's called Opening Night, is the debut theme. And uh, for the first year that we're doing it, and that'll be out for holiday next year. And then oh, wonderful. in 2019, we'll have a new theme and another anthology. So, so how, if somebody wants to get a hold of you now and contact you now, how would they do that? Well, you can uh, send me an email, um, and I'm at info, I-N-F-O, at pageantwagonpublishing.com. My website is pageant wagon publishing.com <laughs> and, and i have a devotional website where i do uh, monthly podcasts i write for um, not only um almost an author uh every month i have my uh, 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 uh literary ladies uh in life and letters uh column but um i write for ruby magazine uh, mm. and, uh, edit that and uh so i do uh, my article every month my vintage book treasure hunt so i'm pulling books yeah. off of my shelf and i am uh, telling you a little bit about it and then reprinting some uh, favorite passages but i also do a companion podcast on that where i do drama oh. and so, where can people find that you can find that at pageant wagon publishing i have a podcast link but i also uh, actually publish that on the writers reverie.com I've had that, that was my first blog, and that's kind of um, devotional thoughts, uh, not always necessarily uh, related to uh, publishing, which is what my uh, publishing family literacy lifestyle blog is at Patrick Mike Publishing. And um, so uh, the writers reverie.com, uh, click on podcast, and you'll see all my past articles and uh, podcasts. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. I think we could talk for another hour. But before we sign off, do you have any parting words of wisdom on why people should be reading the classics? They are a picture of God's hand in the human heart. Oh, man. Amen. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. God gave us 
the greatest classic, which is the Bible. Mm. That's the soil. Our Western literary heritage of the classic is the seed planted in that soil that has given us the richness of our English language and has helped us to understand who we are as, as humans mm. um, and to see who God is interacting with us through the different ages of history. And so um, we, we need the classics in our life. We need to learn from those who don't know. And um, if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat their mistakes. <laughs> yes. We've seen so much of that lately, haven't we? Oh, yes, we have. We that's have. why they say, you know what? Um, turn off all the contemporary stuff going on because there's too many voices shouting at you. And go back to a place where, you know, we were an agricultural society. We didn't mm -hmm. have so much of that. And uh, times were quieter and people thought deeper because they thank, had the time to do that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I just want to thank you and maybe we'll have you back on at another time. But this this is Sherry Lynn Bisbano, and you've been listening to Genre Chat. Be sure to go to SeriousWriter.com. We have other. We have Jerry Jenkins, Stephen James, Cecil Murphy, Holland Webb. We have so many different genres of writing and so many different authors. So be sure to go to SeriousWriter.com. Thank you and goodbye.